they, they come in. Perfect. Okay. I'd love I to. want to thank everybody for being here this morning, first of all, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lisa Oxenhandler with Recruiting for Growth, and I have a little bit of good news, and then I have some gooder news, mm. I know that's not a word, and then I have some great news. Um, the, the, the good news is that if you um, have been coming to breakfast with the expert, we are going to take a summer hiatus, but we're going to be restarting in the fall. So if you have any ideas or thoughts about the way that you would like to see it progress in the fall, please let me know. The gooder news is if you've had even one vaccine and you go to Krispy Kreme, you get a free donut. <laughs> and the best news is that Amy is our expert this morning. <laughs> So I will let you take it away and I've given you permission to, to uh, share your screen. Thank you. Thank you. I love how you call it expert. It, it's like, what is a, a X drip under pressure, drip under pressure. That's, that's what an expert. <laughs> I'm gonna share screen with y'all. This PowerPoint got modified this morning. So I'm one who prays and is a person that sits in meditation and I got a message at 705 to change up a question a little bit. So I'm like, all right, all right. So I came on a little later than I anticipated. Sorry, Lisa. Let's see if it'll no share. Worries. There we go. Valuing diversity, how to navigate. Oh, you can read it. I'm moving on. Here's today's agenda. We've got um, 35 minutes or so. Is that right, Lisa? All right. I have my little clock in front of me. You'll notice on today's agenda, uh, well, I attend an African-American church. Pastor and I met each other at, um, in the doctoral program mm, probably a decade ago and at UMSL at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And um, a little while ago, he said to me, Amy, I want you to share a message. And I looked at him, me and all my whiteness, can you imagine? I challenged authority in a black church. Well, you, you don't, you don't do that. And I, and I know better, but I did. And I said, you know what I said? I said, pastor, I'm no preacher. I'm a teacher. Right. And he looked at me knowingly. He's got a decade on me. So he's my elder. Right. Um, Kim, you know how that knowing look that an African-American elder gives you? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, he gave me that look and he said, well, Amy then teach. And I'm like, all right. Yeah, yes, that's all you can say when that happens. Okay, so, <laughs> so what I'm telling you all is I'm not interested in preaching at you as much as I am um, teaching. And I mean more like not the sage on the stage kind of teaching, but the guide on the side. That's the kind of teaching I'm interested. So if you could like make a note of, uh, of a question you have or uh, something that resonates with you, I'll give you, if we have a little extra time at the end, I would love to share with you and, and kind of talk with you about what's important or what resonates. During this time, since I'm um, taking a workshop that's an hour and a half and shrinking it down to 35, 40 minutes, I'm just gonna have you use your chat box today. So if you could warm up your fingers, that'd be awesome. This is, this is what I'm not gonna preach about, but I'm gonna teach about, I'm gonna give you a warm up question. I'll share a little story. Um, we're gonna define empathy, learn three steps for showing empathy, I'm gonna operationalize it for you. For those of you who kind of an engineering mind, I'm gonna operationalize it for you. We're gonna discover how to use empathy in a cross-cultural conversation. And we're gonna wrap up with a one word summary. And then maybe if we have a little time, Lisa will let us kind of hash things out a little bit. So here's your warm up question. And if you could put your you know, two or three uh, word answer in, in your chat box, I'd appreciate it. So we'll give you a moment. What's the most important ability for leaders to have when they're working with people who have different backgrounds, different stories, um, and different can mean based on gender, generation, race, religion, ability or disability, so-called disability, differently abled. So you think on that. For the introverts in the room, we'll give you a second. Rashed says listening. Angela says curiosity, um, 
She, uh, Caitlin said open-mindedness. Sherry said, agree with Rashad. Lisa said open-mindedness again. And Annette said, curiosity and listening to learn, not to inform. Mm, deep. I missed one. I apologize. I don't know which one I missed. Oh, Jane, understanding that people are different and relating to each to each person, I suppose, differently. Yeah, yeah. Allowing for those differences. Mary said, genuine curiosity. Mm. Sherry said, the ability to see a soul of another human being. Mm. Lance's humility. Yeah. Huh. I love it. There's no wrong answer here. All y'all are right. Y'all are spot on. Here's what the research shows, which is interesting. Look at this. Because the curiosity and the humility, and Kim says the questions and activities that positively include us all, yeah. And that's what happens when leaders express empathy. And it's the number one skill for being able to work with people who have different backgrounds and cultures and belief systems, values, lifestyles. Over all those other skills, it's extraordinary how empathy is off the chart but we don't always know how to express it. Hmm. So I'm gonna share a little story with you to kind of ground us. This is when you kind of sit back and relax a little bit. <laughs> kind of like the librarian, right? You cross your like, what is crisscross applesauce sort of thing? <laughs> sit back and relax. Um, so the story is, it was about a week after I did a similar workshop on empathy uh, in a, it was a manufacturing site and uh, it was a supplier, it supplied uh, gas stations. It was an oil company. And one of the gas station managers, she came up to me um, during the session and it was after the empathy workshop. I do a series of five workshops and this is a little glimpse of one of them. And after the empathy workshop, she came up and she said that she'd been having a hard time communicating with some of the younger people on her staff. So I think she was about in her 60s, right? And, and different cultural differences happen across generation, just like they do across race and nationality and um, gender, right? So she was having a hard time com communicating with people of the younger generation, probably millennials or Gen Zs. And she explained that the workshop had helped her see that she'd gotten so caught up in the day-to-day -day running of her store, that's what she called it, that she'd forgotten to connect with her employees. The afternoon after the session, that empathy session, she'd overheard her team talking and realized she really didn't know much about them. It made her wonder that if it's why some of her employees get so defensive when she corrected them, they'd be like, eh, they didn't want anything to do with it. So I asked her, what'd you do? She said, well, later that day when no one was around, one of my particularly difficult employees and I talked like for the first time. Mm. And she said, I really stopped and listened to him. Now, if you'll remember, if you were here with me last time I presented, I don't know, Lisa, was it a month or two ago? And, right and I, yes. okay. And I taught you the acronym STOP. And, and I'm not referring that today. I promised myself I wouldn't refer to it, but STOP is slow down, take a breath. I can send you the slide on this. Um, observe your reaction and the feeling the other person and proceed with curiosity and wonder. That's stop. So she told me that she really stopped and listened to him. She sat with him and even looked him in the eyes. He opened up about his struggles. And when he was finished talking, she shared a little bit about her past and overcoming challenges. And she said, for the first time, I really understood where he was coming from. And I think he understood me. So I asked her what happened. And she said, well, since our talk, I've seen this change in attitude. He's more understanding with his coworkers and he's up for doing what I ask him to do now. Go figure, right? For those of the parents, right? <laughs> Empathy helped him and her connect. Empathy fuels connection. He also doesn't let the small stuff get to him anymore. All around, he's like this nicer, more productive guy. So that manager saw an increase in productivity when she slowed down and took the opportunity to connect with that younger employee. She was able to appreciate her employee's perspective and change her behavior to show genuine respect. 
She didn't have to agree with him, but she could temporarily change her behavior to show genuine respect for him. And that's cultural intelligence in action because cultural differences can show up within a family, right? How many people have political, how many families right now even have political divides, right? So keeping that story in mind that empathy creates connection. In the chat box, real quick, um, tell me your, this is, this is the teacher in me, tell me your definition of empathy so we can work off where you are. Being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes, Kim said. Sherry said, compassion. Yep. Annette says, trying to see another point of view. Jane says, understanding the other side of, of a view. Yeah, because a viewpoint is a point, is a view from just one point, right? Just your point. Nathan said, oh, Nathan, you're here. Thanks for coming. Um, putting yourself in another shoes, trying to see the world from someone else's perspective. Lisa said, looking at someone else's story from their perspective. Amen. Caitlin, understanding someone's feelings. Mm. Y'all haven't gotten anything wrong yet. Keep waiting to do some teaching. So here's empathy. Here's the definition I'm working with. And anytime you're talking about cultural differences, you kind of got to make sure you're working with the same definition. It's perspective taking. It's putting judgment aside and staying open. I'm not telling you not to judge. You can't not judge. That's a whole workshop that I do on outsmarting unconscious bias, how to outsmart unconscious bias. You got bias. There's just no getting around it, but it's putting judgment aside just long enough to stay open and maybe hear that younger dude's perspective. I think that's what she did. Recognizing the emotion in another and then naming it out loud. There's some empathy. And I got to tell you what it's not. See the little dude around there? It drives disconnection. Sympathy. Mm. We're not going to silver line something. Mm -mm. Oh, why don't you look at this perspective? That's not empathy. Well, well, at least she didn't fail out of school. Mm -mm. That's not empathy. Trying to make something better. It's kind of like saying at least, right? And offering a solution. That drives disconnection. Okay, um, feel free to raise your hand if you love to offer solutions when people bring a problem to you. This mama does. <laughs> All right, so just keep that in mind. And somebody said, the, um, Sherry, was it you? Another word for empathy is compassion. Didn't you say that, Sherry? Yep. There we go. So I'm just gonna break it down. Passio means to suffer. And come means together. So we've got this compassion, suffering together. Mm. It's being with someone in their suffering. So how do you show compassion? Again, this is the teacher in me. Take a swipe at it. How might you show compassion? If we're going to operationalize it, what is... What does compassion look like, sound like? Listen, yep. Lisa says, listen. And, and the question is, what does listening sound like? Rashad says, acknowledgement of some sharing. Hmm. Jane says, ask how you can help. Hmm. Caitlin said, sharing someone's feelings always shows up when I tilt my head. Sherry says, Nathan says, assure someone they're not alone. Ooh, mm -hmm. empathy definitely communicates wholeness, oneness with someone. Let me show you what I, the research I did is that compassion has three steps. Check this out. I'm moving over my chat box. Um, we're going to notice, we're going to feel and we're gonna respond. So y'all aren't too far off. Look at this, I'm gonna break it down, right? 
there's the teacher. Here's step one. You're gonna notice your reaction and an assumption that comes up. Notice how your, your reaction is how you're feeling, right? You're gonna slow down, that stop comes in here. We're gonna slow down and check that you're safe. If you're gonna engage with someone, I want you to be physically and psychologically safe. We're not gonna empathize with somebody when we're feeling threatened. So there might be situations where you need to get out. In this case, you're safe. You can move to step two. Feel your feelings and name them to yourself. So sometimes when I'm teaching and I feel angst, I'll, in the inside of me, I'll actually be going, yeah, I don't blame you for being scary. That guy's scary, right? I'll actually feel my feelings and name my and name it. I'm worried or I'm scared or I'm glad. And then imagine the other person's feelings. For those of you who are empaths, I'm, I'm a little bit of an empath. I can actually feel how other people feelings. For some people who live in our heads, because our society really encourages us to live above the neck, you might have to just imagine how someone's feels. And I just want to make a note here that it can be hard to focus on another person's feelings if you haven't acknowledged your own, mm -hmm. which is why I put that as this first step. If you haven't said, God, I'm scared, um, you're not gonna be able to, I think it was Kim who said, put yourself in another person's shoes if you haven't felt your own feelings. Step three, this is the part that you're saying. Respond by labeling the person's emotion. Label it with, it seems like, it sounds like, it looks like. So if you think back to the gas station manager working with her younger employee, or you can think about in terms of your own family who has a different perspective, somebody has shared something, you might respond with, it seems like you're inspired. It sounds like you're confused. Looks like you're angry. And if you notice we're using you, not I, in, this, in, in the application of compassion or empathy, we wanna keep the focus of the conversation on the other person, which was, it's not time to say, I feel you, I get you, um, I need to know more. Um, this is about you. You're so ripped, you're so mad. Tell me more, what's going on? Keep, the, keep it focused on the other person. If it's a time for you to share your feelings, that's when you use I. We're keeping it on them right now. So what's the value of empathy? There's nothing more frustrating than when people don't understand you. How many times have you spoken with a customer service rep who doesn't know how to actively listen, who doesn't know how to use empathy, and they're not hearing you and you feel totally invisible? There is nothing more frustrating and you need to tell them to come to my workshop because they clearly got something to learn, right? Oh my God, you wouldn't believe how many times I'm like, mm, I need to get you some training. Here's the value, here's the upside. It starts real conversations. Dang. Now you're gonna get more authentic with someone because you've acknowledged them. They, you, they feel seen, they'll keep talking. You'll learn their story. It communicates solidarity. It's one of the things that I love when I'm talking with Kim is there's this sense of solidarity. It's not her, it's not me, it's somewhere between us is this lovely, I don't know how else to put it, mutuality, solidarity, we're in this together. Lisa gives that vibe. Lisa, when you're talking with someone, you, you pause and let them talk and you, you embrace the quiet. In there is empathy and the solidarity. It combats loneliness. Has anyone noticed that in dominant American culture, you could call it white culture, majority culture, dominant culture, loneliness is on the rise. When we slow down and take a breath and we're present with someone and wow, that must've been tough for you. Now we're combating loneliness. 
and in your organization. Now, organizationally, can you imagine what happens? We got extraordinary collaboration that's going to build over time. I've got an organization I've been working with for over a year. And, and it's a riot because they're talking about how people are wanting to join the company for the first time in a decade. They had really bad glass door <laughs> um, evaluations. And now they brought in a new HR manager and the HR manager said to some people that are feeling safer and um, more collaborative and innovations on the rise. And they're like, sure, I'll put something positive on Glassdoor. And slowly they're ratcheting up their reputation. It's empathy. It's so cool. So now wait a minute. Remember I talked about how it, talking with people from a different perspective. So what does showing compassion Oh, it should, oh how, I'm, look at me, my mistake. How does showing compassion help you talk with people who are different? I'm so glad you can see my humanity right there. Can you tell Lisa, this was the question I changed at seven o'clock this morning? I would never guess. <laughs> <laughs> so cultural intelligence is what I do. I am a cultural intelligence strategist. I go into organizations and help folks develop cultural intelligence, which is why I can be a white lady in this work, because I'm not um, so often diversity inclusion efforts are teaching about the other, whether that's another, uh, the culture of another race or another gender, a different way of thinking. I'm not teaching about the other. I'm teaching a skill set, one of which is empathy, right, or compassion, plus recognizing someone's context. There's compassion plus context plus action is cultural intelligence. And if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll actually see um, posted almost every day is a way for you to recognize someone else's story, someone else's context. Because when we feel compassion for someone who's different and we can show it to show respect and appreciate their context, because my context is nothing like a lot of Americans, right? The privilege that I walk around with Oh my God, there's no way that I can even imagine what some people go through, but I can show compassion for their context and my heart can break for them. More than once a week, I'm up in the wee hours in the morning in tears. And I have, to, and, it, and, it, and, and there are times when I have to dial back on my learning because context can be heartbreaking to learn. But it's, it's important to at least appreciate so that people feel visible when you're talking with them. So just to circle back, cultural intelligence is this ability to be in conversation like the gas station manager with her younger person, younger employee, who had a very different perspective and she showed respect. She wasn't changing who she was. She was adapting her behavior to show respect. Annette said, love the idea that people need to feel visible. Yeah, Annette, you're actually spot on. When the first conversation that I have with a CEO that wants to create a culture of not just inclusion, because if you think about inclusion really means included in what, right? And if I'm talking to a, a white male, all due respect, he's part of the dominant culture. And it's like, you really want people to assimilate to the dominant culture of the United States or of your corporation, or do you want people to feel like they belong in your organization, a piece of the puzzle, integral? And, and they're like, oh yeah, it's more than it's more than inclusion, it's belonging that we're working for. And how do you create that sense of belonging? Annette nailed it. You nailed it. It's making sure that people feel valued, heard, and engaged. That that's the promise of cultural intelligence. When you have compassion for different people's context, people feel valued, heard, and engaged. So remember that customer service rep, the bad one that you've dealt with? Mm. Do they make you feel valued, heard, and engaged? Mm -mm. You don't need free stuff to make sure that, that the person you're talking with feels valued, heard, and engaged. Mm -mm. Not when you, show the, when you do those three steps. 
So this is the advertisement real quick. I'm, I'm starting, I'm st I wanna start a movement and <laughs> Kim knows it, right? Sherry knows it, Lisa knows it. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn and learn all sorts of different people's stories. I am working, I've started working recently internationally with a company that's based in, in um, Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, sorry, New Hampshire, oh, Mansfield, England, and Ahmedabad, India. And it's so much fun to start capturing stories on this global perspective, especially since I'm married to a foreign born national, you'd think I would have done that a whole lot sooner, but connect with me. I write a monthly blog. So every time I screw up with somebody, it's like fodder for me learning. And I, you know, I like write a blog about it. Or if somebody asked like a CEO last month, asked me a question, he got fired. Um, he got pushed out of his organization because he was blamed for continuing, perpetuating white supremacy in his organization. And he emailed me and said, we need to have a conversation. And I said, as long as I can write a blog about it and not name you. And he's like, okay. So you can read my blog, I can share it with you. Kim said, wow, yeah. Um, join my workshop series starting April 15th. I've got uh, five workshops that kind of fill up a whole tool bag for you to make sure that you can connect with people in India and the UK and China and Brazil and domestic differences, of course, too. So back to work, cultural intelligence. How does compassion plus context help us connect with colleagues and clients who are different. Now, I'm wondering, Lisa, about time, because this is kind of how we wrap up. What is the timing? Because do we have time to kind of open this conversation up or? Let's take a few minutes. I think this is an important subject that people should be able to ask questions. Okay. Do you, and um, if you do need to drop off as a result of something going on, we certainly understand. Okay, so then what I'm going to do is for the introverts in the room, you'll appreciate because I'm a gregarious introvert and I know I need think time, right? And I know introverts do. Um, uh, hold this question lightly, maybe even make a note and we'll come back to this in just a minute. Um, I just want you to have my information if you drop off. This is my email. If you want me to send you the blog, I will. And also empoweringpartners.com. You can join my workshop series there. You can get my blog, um, read a little bit about me. I wrote a book called Awoke in Progress. Um, that's available through Amazon. So that's how you reach me if you want to continue and help me create this movement. Oops, just kidding. And Amy, this is recorded. So people will be able to uh, see it on YouTube if they want to listen again. Okay. All right. So... Um, because I want to honor different learning styles, if you would prefer to speak up and out, you can do that now. And we are wrapping up at 8.10, Lisa? Yes, okay. that'd be great. So at 8.10, what we'll do is um, I'll have people do a, a one-word summary, share how they're feeling. But right now, let's open it up. And if, they wanna, if we want to stay on longer, we can. We'll open it up for this question. So how does compassion plus context help us connect with colleagues, clients, family members, right? Who have a different perspective or different background. Think about those three steps. Would you all mind um, making note of that question? And I'd like to stop sharing because I'd rather see your faces. That, that's the classroom teacher in me. All right. So how does cultural intelligence help us connect with people who are different? Take a swipe at it. Um, Amy, I'm, I'm just going to share that for me, it has to be about my own self-care first because mm -hmm. I, can, I can feel so depleted so quickly when I am pushing up against, you know, limited worldview. 
groups or, you know, or just plain hate. And, and so, um, so to be able to detach, not necessarily with compassion or detach uh, with neutrality, I've got to, I've got to make sure I'm spiritually centered uh, before I can extend compassion. Mm. Who else has found that? What, Angela, would you mind sharing your experience? Um, well, I, I think to show compassion, I, I too need to be full and uh, centered and neutral. Yeah. Um, to show cultural intelligence, I think is something that I was taught as a child. Okay. So um, not, probably very consciously by my parents, but um, I was always brought up with people of different religions and ethnic group, groups in different countries. I remember as a child, as a um, sign of respect and a gift uh, to a friend of my father's who was from Bangladesh. I went and spent the weekend with his family. Only the host spoke English. Um, but that was a way of communicating that they were bonded. So um, I have appreciated, <laughs> quick, I appreciate what you said because you have put words or models to something that I was taught just to do. Um, so that's it's very helpful. Thank you. I, I appreciate that input because similar to you, I was raised by a dad who ran um, multinational companies, uh, corporations. And so I had a global perspective around me all the time and didn't have words for it until I started this work. It's not enough just to show compassion. If I don't show compassion within and for someone's context and my heart doesn't break to a certain extent, so often universities who are teaching diversity and inclusion, it's this intellectual thing. And so I'm really grateful that I went to the trouble with my now pastor of getting my PhD because that gives me street cred in an academic setting uh, that I can work above the, you know, above the neck. But I've discovered I can't stay there. I have to engage my body and my heart if I'm gonna be in this work and appreciate other people's experiences are nothing like mine mm -hmm. when I'm being with them. I think that um, as I'm listening to you, Amy, and I've listened to you several times, but every time I swear I learned something different. So today <laughs> I'm thinking, showing compassion to me is easy when dealing with people I think deserve compassion <laughs> you know what I mean yeah I, mean, <laughs> I think we are right? let's Raise be honest hand if you, you know could. what I mean if, if I'm dealing with someone that's from a less fortunate situation than I or that genuinely has been hurt by something whether you know physically traumatized or emotionally traumatized those are easy ways to uh, to to use the, this this uh format uh, but what about when you're dealing with what I can only mm -hmm. label as ignorance? Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? What, <laughs> when, when you come across those with these ignorant point of views, oh. so, I, and, and, you know, and so if I, if I turn that around, you know, and put that in the eyes of other people, you know, there's probably a lot of people that just their ignorance of not thinking people even deserve the compassion. Because if, if I believe that there's a certain group that doesn't even warrant me having this level of, of compassion, I can only imagine they think the same way about me. So there becomes another, uh, you know, I guess um, just understanding that everybody at least deserves that space for a moment, I, I guess is the challenge as I'm talking this thing through that even if I believe that they are ignorant in their views, you know Amen. what I mean? 
Um, you know, because that's that's where I struggle when I run against people that I'm like, I just I just don't even understand how you can think that way. Like, what? How were you raised? Like, you know. So that's 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 my struggle. You know, I mean, in this climate, um, mm-hmm. and and that's something that I am really really um, working for because as I as I go forward with my company. I have to learn how to negotiate rooms with ignorant points of views and still be able to reach them like you do. So um, that's what I'm using this, you know, because it's easy to have compassion for people who need it. You know what I mean? Who, you know, to me, but to have that listening ear um, to ignorant views is that's, that's, that's a challenge. Which is where um, Kim, you're spot on and why I kind of had to figure out this acronym called STOP because if I don't slow down, mm-hmm. I'll just railroad right past that person. And, and I really do have to hold space for me and them when I'm right. hearing remarks that are not informed and are heartbreaking to me. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, yeah. I feel and that's like- the depletion that I hear when I hear, um, I don't know um, uh, the, the, the young lady that spoke that she has to have a certain level of reserve because she gets depleted easy. Mm, uh, I felt her in that moment because when you're up against that kind of, um, and I don't want to, you know, we're in the state of compassion. So it's, it's, it's kind of productive for me to, to refer to that as ignorance. So let me just find another adjective, a view that's different than mine. There you go. I'm not knowing. Not knowing. Okay. A, a view that's different, a completely different than mine. Um, it, it is very depleting. It is. It is very depleting coming up against those types of, of uh, um, constructs and, and moods and things of that nature. And, um, but I do believe that STOP acronym is very important because the other part of that is that you may be the light that turns them around. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes yeah. it's through how you respond yeah, encourages them to respond to the next person a little differently. So I, I think as I'm talking this thing through, I've just kind of answered my own question. <laughs> okay. Honestly, honestly, I think I've just answered my own question that no matter who they are, that everybody deserves a stop and to not occupy that space because even as I'm talking and I do stop, my whole mind is occupied on how I'm going to respond. I immediately go into self-preservation mode, like, okay, check your face, wait a minute. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm monitoring myself and I'm not listening. I, I will be the first one to admit I'm not listening at all. I'm trying to talk my own emotions down, you know? So that would be a good one, how to listen without getting emotionally involved like that. You know what I mean? How to have compassion, but not be so emotionally spent when you're Kim, executing it. I'm sorry. Kim, I'm I, I got to... That's workshop number five Okay. on active listening. But I do need to tell you that you do need to be emotionally involved. Not being emotionally involved is minimizing you. Okay. So the very first step is going, man, that guy's pissing me off. Mm-hmm. And, and you acknowledge that in you and you name that in you. And mm-hmm. just feeling you and slowing it down allows you to hold both mm-hmm. you and the other person temporarily. But you're right. You can't be hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. That's you don't go into that space. Oh my God! If you're That's you got to halt. If if you're too tired. Mm-hmm. Hey Jane, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I uh, years ago I managed a very diverse workforce, and um, we had a woman who worked directly for me who was from Ghana. And she, when I interviewed her on the telephone, she had been educated in Wales. And when she came for the interview, uh, I was, I have to be honest, I was surprised because I did not know where she was from. And I expected a petite blonde woman in the lobby. And she was a six foot, the darkest skinned African I've ever met. And I hired her and we had, but she'd been in the States for a while and she dressed very much like every American that we have out there. We also had a lot of Indians in our department who occasionally would wear their 
native clothes. And I had one of my managers kept talking to me about Alice. I don't understand why, blah, blah. And finally, I, I had to step back and I said, Linda, how do you treat Priya? She goes, well, I know that Priya is culturally, and I said, and Alice is culturally different. I said, mm -hmm. Alice is not an African-American. Alice is African. I said, so you need to dial it back and understand she comes from a different place than the African-Americans in this department. So treat each person from where they came from and mm -hmm. how they are gonna translate and, and react to things differently. Beautiful. I said, so that is what was so key with that. And, mm -hmm. and this was the woman who had originally hired me into the department. I was having to have this conversation. And just like when you have five generations of people in the workforce, Yes, she was also the person who came to me and said, I can't stand that these kids have earbuds in. And I said, Linda, they went to college with earbuds in. <laughs> if you take them out, they can't concentrate. I said, now, they also know that if I come up to them or I say their name, they better be able to hear me. <laughs> I said, but so it's understanding and really, and correcting the people when you have to, showing them that it's more than just what you see, because what she saw was, in her mind, an African-American raised in the States, not an African born and raised in Ghana and educated in Wales. And so it, 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 it's really going back and making sure that you stand up for the other people as well. And it wasn't my conversation with Alice. I was having to show the compassion and all of that. It was educating the other people. Yeah, I, I love that you recognize the content for foreign born national is gonna have a very different perspective than perhaps a minority in this country. A co context is everything. When someone says something ignorant, you can actually use the steps of compassion. And when I say ignorant, I mean, not knowing. Not like, knowledgeable. And, and you can say, can you tell me more? It sounds like it was hard. If you use those same steps when somebody uses something not knowing words, you can hear their story and then you can gently invite them to think about someone else's context. Right. That's beautiful, Jane. Well done. We need to wrap up. It's 8.15. Lisa? Well, I was going to say, do you have time for one more? Does sure. everybody have time for one more? Sure. Lance, you had indicated that you struggle with members of the dominant culture. You want to share more about that? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, and, and thanks, Amy. I, I had this thing years ago, very naively, where I thought um, everyone was kind of of a similar viewpoint. And the more I traveled, the more I realized, oh. wow, was I naive. <laughs> and so um, some of my activities bring me around lots of different people across North America. And with social media, you know, we've gotten into discussions on, on race and heritage and things like this and ethnicity. And um, I bump into folks who think that racism doesn't exist and it's a big thing, you know, a uh, construct of the media and on and on and on. And my blood just starts to boil. I, you know, I, I can feel the pressure coming. <laughs> And, and so occasionally I've challenged their views. Well, could you imagine growing up, um, you know, in the 60s, there was still lynching going on when I was a child. This was still part of the culture and the heritage. And, and that wasn't the media, that was reality. You know, and I get pretty angry about them saying, well, you know, but that was a long time ago. And I'm like, it wasn't that long ago. And, and if your grandparents and, and uncles and aunts are subjected to this, it's still very much alive and real. And, you know, we get into these, maybe this is, you know, maybe one of your seminar number seven or eight, but I think I'm, I'm really challenged with not losing my temper around that kind of headspace because I'm thinking, you don't understand what certain cultures are like and you're, you're transferring yours onto it and saying, well, it doesn't exist for me, so how can it exist for them anymore? And, how can, and I, I just, I, I get so mad, you know, and, and then... But conversely to that, I found that I've had other people who say, if I don't challenge it, then I'm complicit to that. And I'm like, no, no, I'm angry as hell, but I'm exhausted on challenging it. You know, like I'm, I'm kind of at that point where I'm like, okay, if you want to be, you know, it's come up earlier on the call. It's like, if you, if you want to really hold steadfast to that belief of yours, you, you go ahead. I'm just going to actually relax myself and go, 
play with other people now. Like, you know what I mean? Because I, I just can't. And so I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. I backed off of a lot of discussions now because it's like, there's no fixing this. Um, and, you know, and I can poke the bear. It just makes it worse, you know. Um, so, so Lance, can I answer your question? Yeah, I, yeah. I hear a question there. How do I respond when, is this the question? How do I respond when somebody is making uh, an unknowing or ignorant remark about like there's no such thing as racism. Well, I guess that that's exactly question? it because I, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get across. Let me. Yeah, I think this is my question is basically put yourself. In, I'm trying to ask them to be empathetic and put themselves in someone else's shoes. Beautiful. Well, you know, walk a mile in their shoes, walk several generations in their shoes, and then tell me there's no racism because I don't believe it. Right. So, so how do I? Yeah. But one of the kind of key constructs of cultural intelligence is appreciating another person's perspective and adapting your behavior to show respect. So when we immediately approach a conversation that I'm going to correct you, they're going to shut you down because they don't want to be corrected. Right. Because in our heads, if we live in our heads, and that's what ha happens in academia, you know, you're getting information and you need to correct that information. Well, it doesn't reach the heart, it's not gonna do anything. If you wanna reach someone's heart, that's why Lisa invited me today. And I'm, I'm so grateful and why we need to show compassion when we're talking with somebody like Kim was talking about, with somebody who just doesn't know, like Lance, they just don't know that racism is a thing and it's, in, it's embedded in, in how our country was structured, right? They just don't see systemically, they only see individually. So if you're only looking individually, I'm gonna appreciate that person's context for a moment. When ma somebody makes a remark, there's no racism. In, our, in the United States, we are the most individualistically oriented country in the world. And, and I know that from a lot of different cultural training. We are not group oriented, we are individual, and we think we are individually responsible for everything. And so we get individual credit, right? And so if we're thinking about racism, it's a systemic problem. Our country was built based on exploiting human beings, Native Americans, BIPOC, right? People of color, Native Americans. So you and I both know that's how the, the, the country was set up. But if you're thinking individually and you work very hard not to, to be racist, then in your mind, in your construct, in your context, there's no racism. <clears throat> and, and how heartbreaking that they don't see that. And yet I have to appreciate that temporarily in order to hear them. So when somebody says, I remember a CEO said to me, I don't understand, this was a couple of years ago, why that football player takes a knee. I had to actually put, like Kim had said, you put yourself, or a couple of people, maybe Nathan too, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. I had to suspend my judgment, take his perspective temporarily and said, I understand you don't want him taking his knee because it feels like disrespect for that fl our flag. And I'm married to a foreign born national, a French guy, and the French people still appreciate what we did for their country, even though it was 75 years ago. So that flag signifies something around the world, the freedom, and you want people to respect that. And he said, yeah, Amy, you understand. Well, Lance, now I have him. Right, I mean, if, right. if, I, if I was manipulative, Damn, I had him, but my heart broke for him, really. And I said, can I offer you a different perspective? Can I offer you a little more information? Well, since I'd heard him and acknowledged his feelings, now he was ready to hear me. I had gone through those steps of compassion for him. My heart had broken for him. So now he goes, yeah, sure. I'll take it. And I said, I wonder what it's like to live in a society where you're always less than because of the color of your skin or because of your gender or disability. I wonder what it's like to not really be able to speak up and out. I'm wondering if taking a knee is the quietest way to say, I feel like I'm not seen in this society. And I said to him, I know you're a Christian and I know that our hearts are supposed to break for people. And I'm just wondering if our hearts could break for that young football player. And he said, oh, I hadn't thought about it from that perspective. And I said, well, it's, 
not that he's right and you're wrong or you're wrong and he's right, vice versa. It, it's maybe both of y'all are right. And he was like, oh, okay. And he was literally ready to get up and leave our coffee. I was like, oh, all right, Lord, guess I've done my work. Is, does that give you a sense of how you might respond with compassion? Oh, oh absolutely. I, I think that was uh, that's magic because yeah, I, I like you said, I, I'm kind of trying to almost I'm so angry at these people, I want to condemn them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. That's not gonna help. Yes. If somebody yes. tries to condemn me, I'm just gonna walk away. Oh, I'm okay, like yes. I got my stuff, you know. Yeah. Well, the goal in cultural intelligence is always creating a win-win situation. But if you want to win, and I don't blame you for wanting to win, yeah, you gotta you gotta make sure they win first. And then people sure. will be ready to to hear you. I, I, I promise. It feels like a magic bullet. It's not. It's just, this is what love looks like and feels like. Ooh, that's a gushy word for a business environment. I apologize. But... <laughs> thank you. That was good. Thank you. Um, could I just have a one word summary from you all? The, the, that's the teacher and me. How are you feeling? Just one word. Call it out. <laughs> Better. Optimistic. Hopeful. Optimistic. I'm sorry, Nathan. Hopeful. Hopeful. Relieved. Relieved. Thank you. I feel, I feel nourished. Nourished. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Intrigued. Intrigued. Compassionate. <laughs> that's butt kissing. You used my word. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't mean to. <laughs> well done. Prepared. Prepared, oh good, good, wonderful. I love how you chose prepared instead of armed. <laughs> That's a much better word. Thank you all for coming. Lisa, thank you for this invitation. Oh my gosh, thank you. And thanks everybody for being here. This truly was fantastic. Amy, I, I really appreciate it. Hope that you will come back in the fall when we reboot, maybe for lesson number five or, or seven. <laughs> We'll see. But thanks everyone for being here this morning. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Amy. See everyone soon. Thank you. Have a great one. Thanks, Amy.